Show us how we can witness to your love through working and worshiping together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. It shines into the world and scatters the darkness. Know that you are and we all are forgiven and forgive one another. Be at peace and walk in the newness of life led by God's light. Our very first hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, 
And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Aku, Shabithia, Hodiah, Masaiah, Elkita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teachers of the law and the Levites were instructing the people, who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and, en and enjoy choice foods and sweet drinks and send to those who have nothing and, and, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength.
Let us pray. God of abundant love, we thank you that we have been presented with all these different opportunities to help your people from around the world. It's wonderful to see smiling faces. We ask that you continue to open our hearts to the needs of the healing and the hunger around the world, that we can take part in making this the world that you imagined it would be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our second scripture this morning is from 1 Corinthians, and we are reading from chapter 12, and we are reading starting at verse 12 of chapter 12. This is a familiar scripture. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are, are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body all together, giving great honor to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now. You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is The Love of God Comes Close.
words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing unto you, O Lord. Amen. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. If Chicken Little lived in Niagara this past Monday, then he would not have been wrong, for in fact, the sky did fall us to the tune of 57 centimeters of snow. The way that the media works these days is to swoop in and capture the height of shock and awe in a time of disaster or a time of chaos and then move on quickly to the next big crisis. Our news feeds, whether they are live streamed or make the 6 p.m. national TV news or get print space in a newspaper, focus on high octane, rapidly changing, usually devastating events. Human tragedy captivates us in an adrenaline rush. And then before our attention drifts too far, we are snapped back to the next catastrophe, which of course keeps us glued to our devices and huffing and puffing when we can't get our daily morning newspaper for the second day in a row. Whether we realize it or not, we are victims and perpetrators to this state of affairs. Not too many gigabytes, not too much airtime or print space is ever dedicated to what happens after the tragedy. We don't get to see or know about the part that comes after the misfortune, the slow, arduous, sometimes discouraging rebuild. Physical, emotional, and spiritual rebuilding takes a long time. Sometimes months, sometimes years, sometimes decades, sometimes generations. And by then, the reporters and the camera operators and editors are long gone. I was reminded of this the other day in a shop when the young cashier told me that her uncle lives one street over from where the tornado touched down in Barrie, Ontario last May 15th. Was that a freak weather event really six months ago? I had almost forgotten that. She was telling me that her uncle still did not have all the blown out windows in his house replaced. A minor new spike for many of us translates into months of energy and money poured into rebuilding for a handful of people. Well, we have long ago moved on. And then there was the fifth estate report last week about the discovery of 215 unidentified human remains in the apple orchard of the Kamloops Indian Residential School last May. After the initial frenzied descent of more media equipment, reporters, and vehicles than could be imagined, the community, the survivors, the families, the elders of the Tecumloops Dequabin people were left not just to pick up the pieces, but to figure out how to go forward after decades of devastation and trauma. Japanese author Makoto Fujimara refers to this as living through ground zero trauma. How does any group of people go on after incredible tragedy? How can they heal? How can they stand back up? How can they rebuild their shattered lives and mend their broken hearts? We find ourselves brought into a similar place and time with our scripture reading from Nehemiah this morning. The ground zero event of the destruction of Jerusalem 
and the time of exile in Babylon are coming to an end. But the trauma itself hangs on them like a heavy cloak. The remnant, the survivors, the next generation are being released and they are returning. I cannot say they are returning home. For the ruin of what lies before them is a broken shell of what they used to call home. Nehemiah has gotten special permission from King Artaxerxes to return to Jerusalem and help his people rebuild the city. The task before them is daunting, but they start stone by stone. They start with the wall of the city. Whole families are given a section of the wall to reconstruct. I mean, they are literally picking up rocks. Their hands are bleeding, their backs are strained, and they are being laughed at all the time. There are some who do not want the Israelites to have their land or their city back. They look at the slow progress on the wall and laugh, saying, Look at that knee-high thing. If a fox jumps on it, it'll come tumbling down. It got worse than that. Some wanted to attack the returned exiles and stop them all together with more violence. So, the guard, so guards were posted, and the slow progress of rebuilding their lives continued. And we read, when the seventh month came and the Israelites settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square. There was more that needed rebuilding than the walls of the city and their homes and farms. Their hearts and souls needed to be rebuilt. But how? How do you rebuild a heart? These were people whose identity was completely unraveled. It was, an ama it was amazing that they had not been entirely assimilated into the Assyrian society over the decades. And we read. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And all the people stood up and listened attentively to the book of the law. When Ezra praised God, all the people raised their hands and responded, Amen, Amen, so let it be. They bowed down and they worshipped with their faces to the ground. And then they had instruction on the scripture from a variety of teachers. And the people wept. It says they grieved. It says they mourned. They cried for the loved ones who never made it through ground zero. They cried for the shame and guilt of what they had been through as survivors. They cried because they had doubted God in their darkest moments. They cried because they could never reclaim their former selves. They cried for everything they had lost and would never be able to get back. Healing a heart comes with a lot of tears. They cried because that day they were free and worshipping the Lord again for the first time in their own way. And the elements of the past were there, all of them. The book of the law of Moses, the priests, the platform, their people chosen to give words meaning and make them clear, the praising, the singing. And the Lord was there too, stepping into their new future with them. In fact, they were realizing that they never had been abandoned, even though they might have abandoned God. 
The Lord had walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And the Lord would continue to walk with them as their lives were rebuilt. They could not go back to the way it was before, but they could go forward, urged to meet God anew in the changing times they found themselves in. We too are met in the traditions of our faith, like the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine and the act of worship. And we are reminded that Jesus is our pathway into the changing times we find ourselves in. Healing from ground zero trauma takes time. It takes tears. It also takes friends and advocates willing to walk with those who are trying to heal. God's presence is our gift commingled with the presence of others, the body of Christ, which is just as much of a gift. Paul wrote, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. These are words written for the early Christian community in Corinth, but they hold true for us today, even in a global sense. How can we truly be at peace or filled with joy if our brothers and sisters are suffering from trauma? Similar words for disaster are Calamity, catastrophe, misfortune, and heartbreak. The antonym of the word disaster, the opposite of the word disaster, is joy. Go and enjoy what is good, said Nehemiah, and share with those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen.
we too are baptized into renewed life. We discover the digni dignity of being human. We are empowered to forsake temptation, for Jesus has won victory over death, and this world is blessed. We join with God who has joined with us in upholding human dignity and working to renew our world. I invite you to join me, please, in saying together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now I ask you to join me uh, in the great prayer of thanksgiving and where the responsive parts are, please feel free to respond at home. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And now let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then, in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to redeem us and to heal our brokenness. Therefore, we glorify your name, joining our voices with all life on earth and the company of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Jesus lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Let us join to proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. By your Spirit, bless this bread and this cup that they may become for us the presence of Christ among us. Shine your light and your love on the offering of our lives. Enlighten us so that we may be your people, the body of the risen Christ, the light of the world, set apart to serve this earth that you have made. Praying in the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was arrested, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ given for you. And he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for you.
May God strengthen you and bless you with peace. May Christ bring justice forth for you and among you. May the Holy Spirit alight on you and affirm you as God's beloved ones. Thank you.